All right, you should have finished the HR Diagram Lab, the final questions for it. Now these are the questions that I have printed out on the sheet for today, and I wanna address each one just one by one. Hopefully you go through the sheet first, think about what you know and what you can answer for each one, and then watch this video and get a bit more explanation. If there's still stuff you don't understand, please jot those notes down um, and come see me, come ask me, ask your peers, email me. Just your goal is to understand as much of this as possible. So the first one, this is really for chapter seven from Birth and Death of the Sun. What balance is upset in variable stars? In class, I had mentioned that when a star uses up or diminishes the amount of hydrogen in its core, then the fusion process isn't as self-sustaining. So the name for the balance in a star, hydrostatic equilibrium, this is the, the balance that is upset, but that doesn't explain everything. So in a star, you have your fusion happening in the core, and that's pushing out creating a whole bunch of heat and pressure. But the overall mass of the star, all of it wants to fall towards the center. And so this balance between gravitational collapse and pressure from the fusion reaction taking place actually maintains the size of the core, the size of the star, as long as there is hydrogen fuel, as long as there's enough protons in the nucleus or the core of the star to fuse into helium. When that hydrogen concentration goes down enough and there's too much helium in the core, then this gets upset and there's some consequences for this. The next uh, thing addressed in chapter seven, why do we think there is not much lithium or beryllium in the sun? One piece of evidence for that is here on earth, we don't think there is much, or there isn't much lithium or beryllium here on earth. And we think that the Abundances of elements uh, in our planet should match the abundances of elements we see in the cosmos. Notable exception being hydrogen and helium, but we explain that because with the fact that those are very low density gases and they just float away in our atmosphere. So there's not much lithium or beryllium here on Earth, so we don't think there's much lithium or beryllium in the sun. We do think that our sun and our Earth, all of it formed from the same cloud of material. So the abundances of elements should be very similar. Um, why do we think red giants are as large as we claim? This goes down to the Stefan Boltzmann law. L is proportional to radius squared temperature to the fourth. If a red giant is a very, or let's back up, if we see a star that is very bright and also very red, that's a low surface temperature. So for that low surface temperature, we wouldn't expect that much luminosity. So to account for that, the star has to have a much bigger radius. Uh, if uh, we had a star that had, say, half the surface temperature of our sun and looked red instead of yellowish white, then that star, in order to be even as bright as our sun would have to be significantly larger than our sun. And the radius only scales as a factor of square uh, to increase the luminosity. So red giants to be as bright as some of the blue stars we see and to be visible from as far away as we see them have to be significantly larger. Why is Jupiter considered the largest possible planet? This is very interesting and counterintuitive uh, result. If we add more mass to Jupiter, we don't think it would actually get any bigger. Gravity would start taking over and start compressing it and making it smaller until the core, just like in the center of a star, got hot enough and um, condensed enough for fusion to start taking place. So Jupiter, in many ways, is the largest possible planet. I like the, the phrase in the book was, what is the largest possible rock? What has been a tool that has shed some light, no pun intended, on star birth and stellar formation that was not available in Gamow's day? Go to these links that I have here. The idea of infrared astronomy. In Gamow's day, we had visible and very much like early, early radio. But infrared, we really can't see 
through our atmosphere in the infrared part of the spectrum. So now that we have telescopes in space, no atmospheric obstruction, we can look out in the infrared and we can see a whole bunch of things on the other part of the, uh, the HR diagram. So if we remember the main sequence, all of the brightest stars are up here all of the nearest stars are down here. In order to see things that are in this part of the HR diagram and also early stages of stars, we really have to look at the infrared. And he just didn't have that available. Uh, what is a planetary nebula? Uh, I explained that in the, the previous video. How is a white dwarf the opposite of a red giant in the context of the HR diagram? Well, this is our main sequence. A red giant is going to be up here, and a white dwarf down here. So red giants are large and red. White dwarfs are small and blue-white. So they are on diagonal opposites of each other on the HR diagram. Maximum size of a white dwarf star. This limit, 1.44 solar masses. I'm going to use the M circle dot notation to represent a solar mass. 1.44 times the mass of the sun is the largest a white dwarf could possibly be. We call this the Chandrasekhar limit after Subramanian Chandrasekhar, who in 1929, when he was 19, worked out uh, the, the nuclear physics and connected it to a bit of special relativity to work out the largest possible size of a star that would be held up by what we call the electron degeneracy pressure. What this really is, is you have a bunch of carbon atoms and maybe oxygen atoms, specifically carbon and oxygen nuclei, making up the core or the white dwarf once, of, once upon a time, the core of a star. You also have these electrons that are swarming all over the place. And these electrons, as they're moving around, they all have different energy levels. They can't have the same energy level. They're all negative. They're all repelling each other. So 1.44 represents the maximum number of electrons surrounding these carbon and oxygen atoms. So the collectively largest mass of stuff you can put together so that everything kind of repels. And you get a little bigger than that, then gravity is going to start taking over and the white dwarf will collapse on itself. And that's a story for the next chapter. Our current theory about the future of our own sun, uh, through which stages will our sun proceed during its lifetime, I will have, a, there'll be a separate video for that uh, at the end of the series. Um, you can look at the uh, sequence in the Cosmos textbook and the, the link I mentioned in the previous video.